Matthew chapter 6, verse number 25, it says this. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he says, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or, what, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you is wor- who by, of you worry by worrying can add a single hour to their lives? Why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow; they do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, in all of his splendor, was dressed like one of them. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow, how much more will He clothe you? Oh, you of little faith! So don't worry, saying, "What are we going to eat, or what are we going to drink, or what are we going to wear?" For the pagans run after these things and need them. But look what he says in verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given unto you as well. Verse 34 is our main verse today. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble on its own. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble on its own. Come on, look at somebody around you. Say, somebody, this will be your best week. That's our sermon title for today. This will be your best week. Jesus communicates to them the same way we communicate to you every single week. And this is where Jesus shows this with his disciples. Let me break this text down and see what God has to share with us. A couple of years ago, when I was in school, I worked for the Vanderbilt women's basketball team. And I never forget the time we played the University of Yukon in the NCAA tournament. But we didn't play them yet. Here's the full story behind it. So Yukon was had won like 90 games in a row. They were the number one women's basketball team that we had seen in years. And so Vanderbilt, we were eight seed, and we were going to face off in this team at Stores, Connecticut. So we flew up from Nashville to Connecticut. We get to the gym, y'all, and, Van, and, and Yukon, this number one team, this top-tier women's basketball team, we're ready to face them. But before we get to Yukon, we had to beat Arizona State. Arizona State, y'all, had tumbled into the NCAA tournament. They had lost six games in a row. And so preparing for film and on this trip, we just knew we were going to come in, destroy Arizona State, and beat UConn. We were ready to make history. We were ready to turn a page. We were ready to be known as this team that knocked off one of the greatest basketball teams ever to exist. So, y'all, we get to the game, and we're playing Arizona State. As we get ready to play Arizona State, y'all, we get into there, and our coach tells us, listen, don't look to beat UConn because you have to beat Arizona State first. Don't get ready for UConn, beat Arizona State. So y'all, we get out there in the first half. Arizona State's up by 15. Keep going in the middle, uh, end part of the first half. Arizona State beats us in the first half by 20. We get into the locker room, and coach comes up to all the players and tells all the players, listen, you cannot beat UConn until you beat Arizona State. Don't get so consumed with beating UConn because you haven't even beat Arizona State first. So long story short, y'all, we got killed by Arizona State. Coach came back in the locker room and said, your season ended because you were focused on what you couldn't even face yet. You're focused on the team you haven't even met yet because you didn't focus on the team that was right in front of you. You didn't beat the game. You didn't win the game in front of you because you were focused on a game you hadn't even entered into yet. You were focused on a game that was next. And I wonder how many times that happens in our own lives. How many times are we focused on what's next so we don't even face what's now? How many times are we focused on what may come that we're not even focusing on the battle that's right in front of us? us. How many times are we consumed with UConn that we don't even get show up to the game against Arizona State? How many times have we forgotten what God is doing? Oh my God, in front of you. Uh, I don't like bees. How many times have we forgotten what God is doing right in front of you that we miss out? We miss, we get consumed, sorry, what God may do, what God hasn't done, but we miss out on what God is doing right in front of us. Jesus is having this conversation with his disciples, and he's telling them that very thing. I don't want you to get so consumed with what's next that you're missing what's going on right now. I don't want you to get consumed with what may come that you miss out on what I'm doing right in front of you right now. And how many times has Jesus stood right in front of you and you've looked past what Jesus is doing right in front of you? How many times has the presence of God shown up in your home, your job, your school, in your bedroom, in your car, and you look past Jesus worried about how Jesus will win the next battle and you can't take the time to bless him right where you are? Jesus tells his disciples, if you're going to have faith and identity as a disciple, I need you, verse 34, don't you worry 
worry about tomorrow because right now I'm right in front of you. Right now I'm blessing you. Right now I'm giving you my presence. Right now I'm giving you glory. Right now I'm talking to you. Right now I'm trying to get something through to you. Right now I'm teaching you to overcome. I'm teaching you to conquer. I'm showing you what you've won. And how many times do we get consumed with the next that we miss right now? Because I don't know about you, but right now the Lord woke me up this morning. Right now the Lord is still blessing me. Right now the Lord is over. I'm overcoming right now. Matter of fact, that's why I tell this last week and I'll say it again. I thank God for where we are right now because right now we've learned to adapt. Right now we're flexible. Right now I'm still alive. Right now I'm in my right mind. Right now Jesus is in front of me and I'm not going to overlook the presence of Jesus consumed with what hasn't happened yet. Jesus says don't you worry about tomorrow because right now I want you to see what I'm trying to show you in this moment. And that was the issue with the disciples. You have your Bibles. Let me show you this this morning because in Matthew chapter 6 Jesus is teaching his disciples what it means to have faith and identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and Matthew 7, Jesus is showing his disciples this full picture. But in particular, when it comes to your spiritual identity in Jesus as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the entirety of Matthew chapter 6. So when you see this, Jesus says every disciple is made up of three things. The first thing he says in Matthew chapter 6, first thing is a disciple is one who prays. I'll show it to you if you go to the beginning of Matthew chapter 6, Jesus gives them the model prayer. Now, here's the difference. We hear the Lord's prayer and the model prayer. The Lord's prayer is when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, he tells God, he talks to God and says, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. That's the Lord's prayer. That's a personal petition unto the Father. But in Matthew chapter 6, we get the model prayer. The model prayer, Jesus says, when you pray, this is the structure of your prayers. Now, here's what's amazing. Amazing, y'all. If I'm going to be a disciple, have identity in the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm a person who models my prayer life after Jesus. And look how Jesus says your prayers, your prayers are acts of resistance. Your prayers resist what's in front of you because contextually, y'all, don't miss this. There were people and systems in place that the people of God had to fight and come against. And Jesus says the way you war against what's in front of you is through prayer. Can I show you in the text? Look what Jesus says. Y'all know the model prayer, but I'll recite it to you. He says, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Here's what that means. What Jesus is saying is, listen, Caesar is trying to get you to focus on him everywhere you look. His name is everywhere. But Jesus says, but if you really want to make the people around you and the systems that are trying to stop you from being what I'm calling you to be, Jesus says, walk up to Caesar and say, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be his name. That God's name is holier than Caesar's name. God's name is holier than any politician's name. God's name is holier than anyone around me. Jesus says, your focus is not on what's in front of you but your focus is on the one name that's holy and our Father which sits in heaven. So he says if you really want to come against the system, he said don't just call the God's name holy over Caesar's name, but he says thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Can you imagine what it's like in a world where Caesar's trying to tell everybody what to do and who to vote for and what history to remember? I'm talking about Caesar and what history to remember. He probably had a bad come over, but who knows what he looked like. But when he was telling people what history to remember and who to worship and what Jesus ought to look like he tells them that the only kingdom that matters is the kingdom that's in glory that don't get so consumed with building caesar's kingdom that you miss out that i'm not here to build the world's kingdom i'm here to call down god's kingdom i'm not here to build up what you like i'm here to call down what god says and he says so thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it already is in heaven so then he says give us this day our daily bread the word bread there is the same word we get from money and the word bread there what Jesus was communicating is remember that Caesar's face was on the face of money that's where we get to the gospel of Mark where Jesus says give to God what is God and give to Caesar what is Caesar's and so what Jesus is saying here is give me this day what I get from heaven watch it I don't need what the world gives me because I get everything from the God I serve and Jesus tells him listen when you pray you're telling the world I don't need what you can give me because my my value is not in you. My value is not in money from the world, but my value is in the God that I serve so I can live because God is leading me. I can move because God is leading me. I can own because God is leading me. So God, please give me daily what I need to be close to you. 
And that's where he says, so then God deliver us from evil and forgive us our trespasses that I don't need the world systems to tell me how to forgive because I serve a God that casts my sin as far away from the north is from the south. Jesus says, if you're going to be a disciple, you are a person that prays down heaven in a world that doesn't want it. A disciple identity in Jesus is someone who prays. Then Jesus continues and says, your identity in Jesus is not just a person of prayer, but number two, he says, your identity in Jesus is a person who fasts, a person who seeks God in private, knowing that God will reward you in private and reward you in public. And he says here, don't you go around looking like the pagans. Don't you go around looking like the Pharisees, flaunting that you're fasting. But you trust that the same God you seek in private is the one who will give you every single reward that you need. Your identity as a disciple, I'm a person of prayer, a person that fasts. But then thirdly and finally, he finishes it by saying, your treasures are not in the world. Your treasures are in heaven. Jesus speaks about wealth in this text, and he's teaching all of us as disciples. He says, listen, I want you to understand that your wealth, don't worship money. There's nothing wrong with money. The issue is when we worship the money that we have. And Jesus says, I don't want you to worship anything. There is no other God before me. So trust me, I will give you every treasure, every desire that you need. Because being a disciple and having identity in Jesus, I pray unto God, I fast to get closer to God, and I trust God for every single thing that I need. So Jesus says with all of that, he says in the text, verse number 25, he says, so don't worry about anything. Don't be anxious because if you pray, if you fast, and if you trust, everything you need will come not from the world, but it'll come from heaven. And it'll be manifested to you through the systems of the world so that you can make Jesus known in the midst of the systems that people have made to reject Jesus from them. And Jesus says, because I'm so big, I'm, I want you all to understand this. Jesus is not sitting on his throne squirming because of our political systems right now. I just want to get that out here. Jesus is not sitting in heaven worried about who's in the White House. I wish y'all talked to me. Jesus is not sitting in heaven consumed about who's in our state house. Jesus is wondering, do I have disciples that are willing to call heaven down on earth instead of worrying about the systems they see in front of them, knowing that I've given you the authority to destroy what's in front of you to make known the kingdom of God on earth. I want us to get past this fear and this worry about people and realize that Jesus is not just coming back for America. He's coming back for people who are looking to serve God and to honor God, and he can still destroy every single thing in front of him. If we are people who pray, who fast, and trust that if God said it, God's going to do it. And so he says, don't you, don't you worry yourself. Don't you get consumed. He said, look at the text. He says, first of all, verse number 25, he says, don't be so consumed with what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink. He says, because that represents your strength. He says, the birds ain't worried about if they're going to eat. But y'all sitting here tripping whether or not I'm going to serve you. I'm going to make sure that you eat. God says, serve me, and every single thing you need will always come unto you. Then Jesus says, and you're worried about what you're going to wear? He says, really what the text is showing us in that case is really we're worried about what people are going to think about our faith. He says, you're so worried about what you wear, what people think about what you wear, what colors. Because remember, what people wore at that time, the tunics and the clothing they wore represented family lineage and represented family history. So Jesus says, you are worried about what people think about you and your last name and your family. Jesus says, if you get over all of that, look what he says in verse number 33. Don't get so consumed with what you eat, you drink, and what you wear. But here's what you need to be consumed with. Seek the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God and everything you need to make kingdom happen on earth. God says, I'll give it unto you. That's a place for every person in this, under the sound of my voice to praise God, that if I really seek after God, if I'm praying after God, if I'm calling on God, every single thing I need will be given unto me. Some of y'all missed your shout cue because you're waiting for me to tell you how to get it. I'm telling you how to get every single thing you need. Seek the kingdom of God. I'm telling you how to pay your bills. Seek the kingdom of God. I'm telling you how to fix your marriage. Seek the kingdom of God. I'm telling you how to ace college. Seek the the kingdom of God. I'm telling you how to get your first job. Seek the kingdom of God. I'm telling you how to heal your, I wish I had somebody. Seek the kingdom of God because God says everything you need to make my kingdom known on earth, I'll give it to you. Y'all missing me. You don't have to earn it, I'll give it. You don't have to buy it, I'll, I wish I had somebody. If I need anything, I'll seek the kingdom and everything I need will be given unto me. 
Jesus says, I want you to be so consumed with seeking my kingdom that you don't worry about everything else that goes on in the world. Because everything you need to eat and to drink and the where will come because you're building the kingdom of God. And what Jesus is doing in this case is Jesus is redefining our identity. He says identity in Jesus, a person of prayer, a person that fasts, and a person that trusts in God. And Jesus is teaching us very simply, I want you to focus on me because all you need is me. And when you trust in me, every single thing you need will come your direction. Now, the problem in this text is the same problem I think we have in the world in today to try to own what God is saying, and that is capitalism. We've gotten so consumed with money being a definition of success. We've gotten so consumed with wealth being a definition of success. We've gotten so consumed with capitalism. That's the very reason why we'll get back into the world to try to get other people sick and calling certain people essential and now calling other people therefore non-essential because capitalism has defined the kingdom of God. Let me tell you something. Jesus, I told you this earlier, is not sitting in heaven squirming on the throne because of capitalism. Jesus didn't come because of capitalism. He came so that we might have life. I wish I had y'all talk to me and have life abundantly in Jesus Christ. And Jesus challenges us that if we want to destroy the stuff that we have created to freeze Jesus out, it's going to mean some people are willing to wake up day in and day out and seek the kingdom of God and everything that comes from the kingdom because that will destroy anything that sin has created. Jesus chose us and challenges all of us as disciples. My identity is not in my title. My identity is not in where I live. My identity is not in what I wear, but my identity is that I'm a kingdom seeker. I'm a kingdom builder. And because I wish to bring Jesus everywhere I go, nothing can stop the movement of Jesus, not even the systems we created to freeze Jesus. I wish somebody would talk back to me this morning. And Jesus says, here's what I want you to do in verses 33 and 34. I, don't, I want you to plan for the future, but I don't want you to get so consumed with the future that you stop building kingdom. And Jesus says, so live daily in expectation that I'm going to come. And here's what he says. He says, therefore, don't you worry about tomorrow because tomorrow's got issues. Now, I've heard this text preached, and I read this issues, and we preach this text about issues. We, we think those issues are like what your bo- boss is going to say, what your coworkers are going to say. I think these issues, we dumb them down to the petty things in our world, when really the issues that Jesus was addressing in this text had nothing to do with a Facebook status or a tweet, because some of us lose our whole life over a status. I mean, I mean, just to be honest, when you lose our whole life over three dots on an iPhone, I don't, I don't get it. Like, I'm just, my whole life is over, and you really losing your mind over some fool? I mean, really, I mean, my whole life is over, over a fling, over a one-night stand. I wish y'all talked back to me. And Jesus is not saying, don't worry about tomorrow because your one-night stand is going to be tomorrow. Here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. Hear this, because there will be something in tomorrow that will try to get you distracted from being a person of prayer, being a person that fast and being a person that trusts me. So Jesus says, today, I need you to live as a person of prayer, a person of fasting, and a person that trusts in me. Your issues are not a status. Your issue is the world doesn't want you to be a disciple. Hope you hear me. And so your issues then will come to distract you from your relationship with Jesus. But the way that I can make every day my best day is I wake up looking for times to talk to God. I wake up looking for periods to fast with God. And I wake up looking for ways to trust in God. That if God says to seek him, I'm going to knock over every single thing. I'm going to get some brand new glasses because every single day I'm going to seek because he told me I'll find. If God tells me to knock, I'm going to knock on every single door until the door opens because the Lord told me to knock. If God tells me to move, I'm going to move just like that. And every single day, God says your issues are not the petty things. Your issues are the things that try to keep you distracted from being a disciple. The issues that you have in your life are the ones that are threats to your ability of being a disciple, a challenge to being a believer. And Jesus tells us, I want you to name the threats in your life that threaten you from being a person of prayer, threaten you from being a person that fasts, and threaten you from being a person that trusts in God. Jesus says, so seek the kingdom and name what's against you so you can name how you can overcome the very things that are distracting you from being a disciple. So how do you have your best week? I have my best days. And my best days say every day I'm looking up and looking for reasons to pray, 
to fast and to trust in God. And if anything comes against me being a person of prayer, a person of fasting, and a person that trusts in God, I'm going to destroy it and cast it back to the pits of hell because if I'm going to be a disciple, I'm going to be someone who prays, someone who fasts, and someone who trusts in God. And I know this ain't popular preaching because I don't even want to preach it either, but I'm challenging us as disciples. Disciple makers are people who pray, who fast, and who trust in God. What are you doing today? I'm a person of prayer. How are you going to live today? I'm going to fast with God. How are you going to get over today? I'm going to trust God. How are you going to make it through this, I'm going to trust God. How are you going to make it over this? I'm going to talk to God about it. I'm going to seek the Lord about it because every single day a disciple is only being distracted to, to not do those three things. Your issues are not petty issues. Your issues are challenging your prayer life. Your issues are not petty issues. Your issues are what's challenging you from trusting in God. Therefore, I create idols to distance me from the love of Christ. When Jesus says, I simply need you to trust in me. So what are the threats in your day-to-day life that cause you to be distracted in your prayer life? Hold up, back up. Who are the people that come into your head that distract you from being a person of prayer? Who's the person you call that you know when you call them, they're going to keep you on the phone for an hour and a half talking about nonsense. And by the time you get off the phone, God, you know my heart. Like, God, come on, you know me, and I'll get you tomorrow, God. We'll just add it on to our tab tomorrow. What are the situations? What is the Netflix show or Hulu show or Peacock show or Apple TV show or HBO TV? I don't know what else is out there. Roku show, whatever's out there. What is the television, love it or list it. What is a television show that distracts you from spending time with God? Jesus has named these threats because if you're going to seek the kingdom, that means I'm going to make sure I don't let my distractions get in the way of me being a person who prays, me being a person who fasts, and me being a person who trusts in God. Because when I do those three things, I can indeed have my best week. So how can I do this? Let me give you two practical things really quickly, and I'll take my seat. Number one, I want you to manage vision before vision manages you. Manage vision before vision manages you. Vision is the foreseeable future given to those who trust in God. That when you're a person of prayer, God reveals to you what's about to happen before it happens. So you have the faith to trust God that it will happen and then tell somebody else what did happen because you're trusting God. Vision is the foreseeable future given to those who trust in God. So church, here's what I want you to do. I want you to manage vision before vision manages you. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom and the righteousness of God. That's the vision we have. Here's what we're called to be as Christians. Very simply put, we are called to imitate Christ so much that my life gets so consumed with Jesus that when people see me, they see Jesus. And before they idolize me, Jesus brings me back home and high fives me in heaven because I live my life in a way to imitate the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why funerals are not a somber place. They're a place to rejoice that that person looks so much like Jesus that the only place they can live is in glory with Jesus. And so our goal is to imitate Jesus. And so if that's the long-term vision, for us, Jesus says, here's the only thing you have to do. Seek the kingdom. So manage the vision that God has before vision comes and tells you what to do. That's why we are not reactive people. We are proactive people because when I pray, God gives me a glimpse of the future and I trust God before it happens, knowing that it will happen, that if somebody asks me a question, I can tell them the only reason it happened is Jesus, only Jesus. And I think as Disciples Church, we've gotten so consumed with responding to it. We get so surprised when God does something. We get so surprised when God makes a way because I'm not managing the vision that God told us was actually going to happen. Manage the future before the future tells you what to do. Um, I remember 2016, we had a vision team meeting. And I remember we sat there. I was sitting in the fellowship hall with a couple of the people, and I was telling them over the course of the next three years, God, no, of course, the next two years, I'm sorry, at the time, three years. And of course, the next three years, we're going to baptize 100 people, and we're going to get over 200 people in attendance. At the time, it sounded very stupid. I, and the people at the table said, Pastor Justin, if that's what the Lord said, we're going to do it. And I said, God, I don't know what he's talking about. I don't know where we're going to sit him. I don't know how we're going to baptize 100 people. I don't know what we're going to do. Deacon Price said, let's fix the baptism pool. Deacon Metz said, let's pray over that. I'm sitting here, hold up. I don't know where we're going to sit him. I don't know what we're going to do. But God said 200 people in three years. I remember the next year, that September, Deacon Price came up to me after service. Hey, Pastor Justin. 
Um, we got like 170 some people in worship. Uh, what are we going to do? And I was sitting here saying God told us this, but I didn't trust God when God said it. And therefore now the future is telling us what to do. Now we're back. We're behind it. I'm behind it as a pastor. I'm behind it as a leader because I wasn't managing vision before vision hit us. We didn't prepare space for God to move. I didn't prepare space in our church for God to work. I didn't prepare staffing. I didn't prepare things. So church, I'm telling you from my failures, don't let God tell you what to do and you don't trust it. So then when it shows up, now you're all surprised. Now church, when God tells you to move, you find some ways to move. You get your running shoes on. You're jumping over building because God said to run. If somebody tells you to apply to that school, don't, tell, don't let them disqualify you. Baby, I'm applying because God said it. If God tells you to get in that relationship, don't you dare question it. I'm going to run. I'm going to jump. I'm going to holler. I'm going to scream because God. if God said it, I don't know if it's going to happen tomorrow or next year, but all I know is that if God said it, it will come to pass. That the vision is for an appointed time. In the end, it will speak and not lie. So though it wait, you better praise God in the meantime because it will come to pass. Don't you let the future tell you what to do, but you, I'm running. What are you running for? I'm running on a vision. Yo, there's an old story told about rhinoceroses that when rhinos, watch this, when rhinos uh, run after something, watch this, rhinos take, take, they have their eyes on the sides of their head, not in front of them. Uh, so what rhinos do, y'all watch this, is that rhinos turn their head one side. They turn their head to the other side they close their eyes and then they run and somebody asked we asked them what in the world is a rhino running on they said what the rhino does is the rhino paints a picture in its head it doesn't run based upon what it can see it runs upon the picture in its head i wish i had some rhinos in the building i, I got a, i got a picture i'm gonna pay dead off i got a picture in my mind i will graduate i wish i had some rhinos up in here i got a picture i don't know i'm gonna buy this ring for my engagement but i got a picture on my mind i don't I don't know how I'm going to get through COVID, but I got a picture on my mind. And they that, am I talking to anybody in the building? The reason I'm here this morning, I got a picture on my mind. The reason I praise God, I wish I had some folk that can warm your body up right now and give God glory for the picture on your mind. I wish I had somebody. I got a picture of getting out of debt. I got a picture of getting my first house. And they that wait upon the Lord shall I wish I had some rhinos. Where are my rhinos at in the building? that can toss your head back. I got a picture on my mind. I, I refuse to be a reactive Christian when God tells me what's going to happen. I refuse to be a reactive person when God tells me what's going to happen. So you manage vision before vision manages you. Second thing the text shows us, watch this. God says, I then I want you to practice a healthy perspective. I want you to practice a healthy perspective. Look what he says. Seek first the kingdom of God. And here's this clause that I never really liked reading because it's not fun to read when you're reading this text. He says, seek the kingdom of God, watch it, and his righteousness. I don't like that because if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna be like Jesus, I gotta love people that folk don't love. I gotta, I gotta forgive people I don't feel like forgiving. Matter of fact, I gotta die to myself every day. I gotta pick up a cross, a symbol of humiliation, and carry it Every, I don't, I don't, I don't, I like to seek the kingdom, but I don't like Christ's righteousness. And I like this in the text because Jesus is telling the disciples and he's also telling us, where are you honestly in your faith walk? Because often when we get to this place about righteousness, we, we see this as this, this unattainable goal. I got to imitate Jesus. But Jesus is showing us in this text, it's not it's not just a goal, it's, it's a journey. And, but you have to acknowledge where you are. Like You have to acknowledge the first step before you run up the staircase. So where are you? Where are you in your faith walk? I want you to honestly name this in your life. Where are you in your righteousness walk? If you were saying, I'm going to imitate Jesus, I'm desiring to look like Jesus, where's your, like, how is your prayer life, honestly? How, how, healthy, is your, how healthy is your fasting life? You're, you're trusting in God life. Where is your perspective? I want you to get a healthy perspective of don't beat yourself down because of who you are, what you've done. But I want you to see where you are because Jesus says, here's what I need you to do. I need you to seek the kingdom of God. And then I need you also to seek righteousness at the same time. I need you to seek being like me, loving like me, moving like me, trusting like me, praying like me. Honestly, name where you are so you can see that Jesus still trusts you on the journey. I'm talking to people who feel like you're far from God. People who feel like Jesus has walked away, you're not, you can't pray like your grandmama did. You can't fast like your granddaddy did. And here's what I want you to do. Stop worshiping other people's journey and go on your own journey. Seek first the righteousness of 
God, what would it be like for you to wake up and to say, God, I'm seeking after building your kingdom to make disciples, but I'm also seeking to look more like you, that when I look in the mirror one day, I can see my eyes have become balls of fire. When I look in the mirror another day, I can see my hair is becoming more and more like lamb's wool. When I look in the mirror, I can see my heart is being rendered for communities they never rendered before. But I can honestly say right now, Jesus, there's some people I don't want to be saved. But God, work on that so I can know I want all people in heaven. Jesus, there's some people I won't listen to. So God, work on that part of my heart that I don't want to give over to you, God. There's some people I don't want to be close to you. But God, rend my heart for what rends yours so that eventually I can look like you. I can be like you. And when I see See you, you'll embrace me because I look so much like you that no one can tell the difference because whenever they encounter me, they know they've left the presence of Jesus. So Jesus, I'm challenging you, church, every single day to seek the righteousness of God. God, I want to look like you. I want to walk like you. I want to, I want to breathe like you. I want to talk like you. I want to pray like you. I want to give like you. I want to love like you. I want to cry. I want my prayers to cry like drops of blood because I'm worried about my community not knowing Jesus. I want, I want people to be so close to Jesus that they want to grab the hem of my garment because they know if they get close to me, the power of God comes off to me. I want people to be so powerful that if they get in my shadow, they get healed. I want, I'm not talking to anybody, Jesus. I want to look like you. I want to move like you. I want to love like you. I want to pour out like you. I want to live. I want to live like you. I want to be rejected like you. But I want to love them like you because I'm not seeking to build my ego. But I want to look like Jesus. I wish I had some folk. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to go here. But I wish I had some people that came out on a chilly Sunday morning that could say, "I just want to look like Jesus. I just I want to love like Jesus. I want I, I want God to get past my bias, my assumptions." because I'm seeking the righteousness of God. Church, I was praying about this, and God says, I need some people who just want to look like me, who, who want to love like me, who want to worship like me, who want to get on their faces like me, who are unashamed like me, who are willing to be humiliated like me, because they know if you imitate me, if you lift the Savior up, I'll draw all men unto me. I'll draw all women unto me. I will fix the future. I will change the culture. I, I wish I had somebody. I want to look like Jesus. You manage vision before vision manages you. You practice a healthy perspective of your faith life. And thirdly and finally, you reapply pressure to what's pressuring you. You reapply pressure to what's pressuring you. I asked you earlier, name the threats to your prayer life, name the threats to your fasting life, and name the threats to your trusting in God walk. And Jesus challenges us, therefore, when you name what's against you, now you don't fight that thing by avoiding it, Whew, but you fight that thing in war and prayer. And you pressure the things that are trying to pressure you. Um, you pressure the things that are trying to distract you. You pressure the relationships that are trying to throw you off course, that I'm not going to fight the person who doesn't want me to pray. I'm going to pray for that person. I'm not going to fight the job that, doesn't, that wants to make me work till my knuckles come out of my skin, but I'm going to pray for that job. I'm, not going to, I'm going to find the gaps in my life that distance me from Jesus, and instead of complaining about it, I'm going to take that thing to the altar knowing that if I build the kingdom of God, God's going to give me every single thing I need to make him known in this world. If you really want to fix where you are, apply pressure in prayer and fasting. That's why Jesus came back to the disciples and the disciples asked Jesus, Jesus, why couldn't we do those things? And Jesus said, some things only come by prayer and fasting. You can learn so much, but I dare you to be an educated prayer person. I, you, you, can, you can be connected as much as you want to, but I dare you to be a connected prayer person because here's what my grandmama said. She said, Jesus is still on the main line and you just tell him what you want. She said, call him up and tell him what you you want. If the line is busy, call him up. If nobody answers, you keep on calling and you apply pressure in prayer to the things that are pressuring you. You know, how, how good have you gotten at coping and covering up things instead of bringing the things you're coping with and bringing the ways you're covering up things and bringing them to Jesus? Oh, we get real good at numbing our pain through whatever ways you numb your pain. What would happen if you brought the pain to Jesus and didn't try to numb it with the world? 
talk, Justin. What would happen if you got stopped getting so consumed with how good you are covering up sin that you took the veil off and you said, Jesus, this is how ugly and a wretch undone I am, but because of the cross, I know that you still cover every single scar in my life, and I'm not going to pressure myself by talking about how bad I've sinned, but I'm going to rejoice that you still hear me when I call. Am I talking to anybody? This is the week where I pray a little bit harder. This is the week where I trust a little bit harder. This is the season where I fast a little bit longer because I'm not going to drink myself to sleep. I'm going to pray myself to sleep, God. I'm not going to sex myself. To, I wish I had somebody. I'm going to worship my way to sleep. I'm not going to smoke my way to sleep. I'm going to worship my way to sleep. I'm not going to be angry my way to sleep. I wish I had somebody. This is the last week where drinking is my coping. This is the last week where anger is how I cope. This is the last week where insecurity is how I cope because if I seek the kingdom of God, if my people, I wish I had some Bible-believing, unafraid folk in the building, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I know I'm talking a whole lot of Bible, but I wish I had some Bible-believing, unafraid folk up in here who can lift up holy hands. I got the gospel, and if I stand on the gospel, no weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper. If I stand on the gospel, I can step on scorpions. If I stand on the gospel, I can be strong and courageous. And every place my feet trod, I wish I had some crazy folk who are unashamed to tell somebody I love the Lord because he heard my cry and pitied every groan. And as long as life pressures me, I'm going to worship my way out. I'm going to shout my way out. I wish I had some crazy folk that could help me close this sermon. Lift up your hands. Stand on your feet and give God the best praise you've got. I'm going to fight my exams through my worship. I'm going to fight my marriage through my worship. I'm going to fight my finances through my worship. And the higher I lift him, the more he'll draw. The more I praise him, the better I feel. The more I lift him, the better I feel. I dare somebody outside on September 20th to lift up the Savior for all to see. Lift up the Savior for all to see. Has he been good to you? Has he made a way for you? Well, don't you wait until Monday to praise him. But right now, clap your hands. Oh, you just go, Joe, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph for he's worthy. He's worthy. Move out your seat and begin to bless the Lord all by yourself. Because when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord's been good to me. I dare somebody take 15 seconds. Give God the best praise you've got. Come on, I say give him the best praise you've got. Come on, apply pressure to what's holding you back. Apply pressure to what's making you cry. Come on, give God the best praise you've got. Come on, open up your mouth. Clap your hands on you people. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. I need some crazy folk outside to show the world what praise looks like. Bless the Lord. Clap your hands. Stop your feet. The Lord's been good. On. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. I dare to free yourself. I dare to lose yourself. Everybody clap those hands. I dare you to lift your hands right where you are, right where you are. Right now, I dare hear this, what I want you simply to do. You praise him. That means you thank him for what, he, for what he's done. But in this morning, you just lift your worship and just give him glory for who he is. Come on. Come on, I dare you to give every single thing that brought you here to worship this morning back over to him. Come on. Come on, I dare you to give every single thing back over to Jesus. God, I'm giving you my worry. Come on. I'm giving you my fear. Come on. I'm giving you my frustration. I'm giving you my marriage. Come on. I'm giving you my children. Come on. I'm giving you my finances. Come on, right wherever you are. Come on. This is the generation of those that trust him. Come on. This is the generation of those that trust him. Y'all missing me. This is the generation of those that trust him. And I'm looking for some people who trust God right now to 
release a worship right where you are. God, I trust you for my finances, yes. I trust you for my job, yes. I trust you for my children, yes. I trust you for my marriage. I trust you in my emotions. I trust you in every single thing where I can't see you. I will seek the kingdom and your righteousness. Come on, I dare you to lift up worship right where you are. God, we trust you. God, we trust you. God, I trust you. Come on, I dare you to just say that, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. God, I trust you. I can't trace you, but I trust you. I can't see you sometimes, but I trust you, God. I know you're right in front of me. So, God, I'm not going to wait till Monday comes, but right now, my prayer life, I trust you. Right now, God, in my fasting, I trust you. Right now, God, in my money, I trust you. Come on, I don't want you to wait till next week, but I want you to take 30 seconds while we're outside. You already made it here, so don't leave here without getting what you came for. I dare you to open up your mouth and lift your hands where you are and say, God, I trust you. God, I, I trust you. God, I trust you. God, so spirit of the living God, fall fresh. Hey, 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 God, fall fresh, my God. Fall, y'all missing this glory. Fall fresh, fall fresh, fall fresh, fall fresh, fall. Give me fresh strength. Give me fresh mercy. Give me fresh grace. Give me fresh intuition. Give me fresh praise. Give me fresh opportunity. Spirit of the, I dare somebody lift up your hands. Fall fresh, fall, fall fresh on my marriage. Fall, yeah, fall fresh on my job. Fall fresh on my emotions. Fall fresh on me. Jesus. I want you to be praying for yourself in the name of Jesus. Hear the cries of your people, God, in the name of Jesus. This is the generation of those who trust you. God, this is the generation of those who trust you. So, Spirit of the living God, give them the right name to name themselves in this season. Give them the right mercy, God, to extend to themselves and others. And right now, God, I pray for their finances. I pray for relationships, God, in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, for prayer time and fasting time. I pray, God, against the distractions that are competing for them. God, I pray, God, against the things that are warring against their souls and I pray right now God for fresh strength and new strength over every person under the sound of my voice. God do your best work through them. Do your best work in them. God bring them beyond themselves right now God. So spirit of the living God break them right now to be to know what it's like to be close to you. Pour yourself on them right now God so they know what it's like to have oil like you. And Father I pray right now God for righteousness to be our goal. I don't want to be popular. I want to be righteous. I don't want to be known in the world. I want to be righteous. So kill my God. Kill our egos right now, God. Kill our pride right now, God. Kill our anger right now, God. That our worship will speak to you and you'll be pleased with what you hear. So God, grab us where we are and bring us to where you need us to be. In Jesus' name, I dare every person on the sound of my voice take 10 seconds and just lift, lift the best worship unto God you possibly can live. Come on, call him whatever name you call him. Come on, call him. He's Abba, he's Yahweh, he's Jehovah, he's Rapha, he's Adonai, he's Elohim. Come on, he's Jesus, he's Jehovah Tishkenu, Jehovah Shalom. Come on, lift up the Lord right now. Come on, I dare lift him up like you're in front of him right now. God, I love you. God, I adore you. God, you're wonderful. God, you're beautiful. God, you're the air that I breathe. You're the life that I live live. You're the power within me. Come on, I dare you to begin to worship him like you've never worshipped him before. Because God, I'm going to trust you right now.